Okay, well we're going to do a quick video on acoustic admittance testing and interpretation, and then I'll do a quick video on audiogram interpretation. So, uh, acoustic admittance essentially refers to a general term that um, <clears throat> describes how well energy moves through a system. Um, and um, the opposite to emittance is impedance, which is measured in ohms. Here's some of the instrumentation we use to measure uh, acoustic emittance. Uh, our tympanometry falls underneath that umbrella. Um, and so what we have here is a loudspeaker that plays a sound. We have a microphone that records the intensity of the sound. And then we have a pump. Uh, that puts positive or negative air pressure into the ear and when the um, in, in a normal a person with normal middle ear function when the positive when the air pressure is extremely positive or it's extremely negative the ear doesn't move a lot the eardrum doesn't move a lot so a lot of the sound is reflected back and that's how we know um, <clears throat> how well the eardrum's moving. So when the eardrum's moving well, um, and there's not a lot of pressure, then the um, a lot of the sound will be admit admitted, and that's that's kind of how it works. So tympanometry is the uh, most common test that we do. Um, and it's a measurement of the eardrum emittance um, as a function of air pressure in the ear canal. And so um, if the pressure is uh, normal behind the eardrum, then the pressure in the ear canal, uh, the admittance in the ear canal will be uh, high. Okay, and so basically think of, um, and I'll show you that the, the um, graph for uh, the uh, tympanometry test which is called a tympanogram and it'll make sense once you see the graph. Um, so what we do is we put the probe in the ear and it's sealed. Uh, it has to be sealed so we can maintain the air pressure. And then we record this uh, emittance from plus 200 to minus 400 decapascals is that uh, unit of measure. And the resulting graph is called a tympanogram, which we'll go over. So the input to the system is a, a probe tube generator. We use a 226 hertz tone. That's because that's the, for adults, the tone that has been found to um, work the best. We use an air pressure pump, and then we use this, um, there's also a acoustic reflex eliciting tone generator. The output <coughs> essentially is what we get uh, in the microphone. So what, why do we use emittance audiometry? We use it to detect middle ear pathologies, differentiate cochlear losses from retrocochlear pathology in the cases of acoustic reflex. Uh, not so often, but you can use it to estimate uh, hearing sensitivity, and then we do it to cross-check and be sure that our pure tones are accurate. Here are some values that we use. Static admittance, which is the admittance of the middle ear system, tympanum, uh, tympanic peak pressure, which is the peak of the tympanogram, Tympan uh, tympanic width, with which is how wide it is, and then the ear canal volume, which is essentially estimates how much uh, volume is in the ear canal when you're doing the test. So if you think back to your undergrad class, if you had one uh, with uh, uh, introduction to audiology or some course like that, we have different classifications and they're all on the screen at one time and we'll go through each one. We have uh, a type A tympanogram, type A sub S, type A sub D, type B, and type C. And we're going to go through each one um, individually. Now let's look at this graph for a second. On the bottom, on the uh, x-axis, you have pressure um, in decapascals. Okay, so zero decapascals means uh, zero pressure plus 100 plus 200 minus 200 minus 300 minus 400. Now 
So you essentially, for adults and kids, you want that pressure peak, this thing right here, to be somewhere between plus 100 and minus 150. So somewhere in this general region, you want that peak to occur. This peak is essentially the maximum move it, uh, movement of the, tim of the tympanic membrane. Okay, we call that compliance or admittance or um, <clears throat> just tympanic membrane movement. Okay, so you want that peak um, to be somewhere above, this is 200 on this scale. Um, a lot of scales go 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4. This is just a different unit. So on your uh, notes, you can put 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1 1.0, 1 1.2, and 1.4. But you want it to be somewhere above 0.2, okay, just as a general rule, okay? So in this case, when you look at a tympanogram, this is a normal tympanogram, you want to look at where the peak pressure occurs, and you want to look on the x-axis, but you also want to see how high the tympanogram is. And this is like, what, 0.8 or so? So this would be a normal type A tympanogram, something that you see in an individual without middle ear issues. Um, and the uh, pressure, so you would describe it as having zero decapascal pressure, which is normal because it's between plus 100 and minus 150, and then having 0.8 of uh, compliance or uh, admittance, A-D-M-I-T-T-A-N-C-E. And so that peak height is essentially a measure of <clears throat> um, tympanic membrane mobility. Okay, so that's a type A. Here's a type A sub S, and when I was in school, we were taught that this, the, the, the sub S, subscript S, could be thought of as a stiffness tympanogram, okay? So in this case, you have, um, you have a peak that occurs between plus 100 and minus 150, but it's down like 0.1 or 0.2, okay? So... Um, this would indicate that the tympanic membrane is a little stiff. It's not moving as much uh, as in the first. And this is often uh, common with uh, otitis media with a fusion fluid buildup behind the ear where they're starting to have a stiffer system because of that or other kind of uh, ossicular fixation, which we'll learn about in the next chapter. But So a type A tympanogram characterized by normal uh, peak pressure, so it occurs between plus 100 and minus 150, but it's reduced in mobility. Okay, that's a type A sub S. A type A sub D, uh, I was taught that the D could stand for um, <clears throat> deep or disarticulation is what I was taught, but in a type A sub D tympanogram, you have normal pressure again, your peak, if you could see it on here, a lot of these scales go up to 2.0. So if this went up to 2.0, um, you would be able to see it. But uh, the peak is uh, high, Very the eardrum is very mobile, right? So you have a normal pressure of zero. So the peak occurs at zero and it's higher than say 1.5 or 1.6 or whatever the uh, admittance value of that particular clinic would be but most in most clinics if it's above 1.5 1 1.6 1 1.8 1 um, then you have a uh, a sub d which is a deep tympanogram so these are often characterized by disarticulation of the ossicles so um, you know, individuals come back from serving in, 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 in times of battle and so forth, and so they could have had uh, an acoustic uh, blast that broke their uh, middle ear ossicles, and so this is an example of um, a condition where you could see a type A sub D. Now, the flat tympanogram is a type B. There's no discernible peak. 
Okay, so you don't you don't have a peak pressure with a type B tympanogram. You have a flat, essentially, tympanogram with no peak. Uh, very common with middle ear effusion, perforated tympanic membranes, uh, cerumen occlusion. You know, if they're testing it wrong and they have the probe up against the wall, a lot of first year AUD students do that. They don't realize. But that's a type B tympanogram. A type C tympanogram is when you have some kind of tympanic height, meaning that there is movement, but it's occurring outside of the normal pressure of plus 100 to minus 150. So this one's occurring like what? Minus 250, right? So um, this is a type C tympanogram. So you have normal, what, 0.7 movement, the height, but it occurs at minus 250. So this is common with negative middle ear pressure. And again, this is what we say. Uh, the peak of the uh, tympanogram will occur where um, the middle ear pressure behind the eardrum occurs. It'll move the most. And so this is moving the most at minus 250, which is a negative pressure. Kind of like you're going up in an airplane, you feel that pressure. Uh, open and close your mouth, it pops, and then it goes back. So this is uh, a type C tympanogram. Now acoustic reflexes, we're just going to briefly talk about this. Um, we use acoustic reflexes to look at the neural pathway of the auditory system. Okay, There's a, a pathway that the an acoustic reflex, which is a change in the admittance of a system with a moderate to loud input okay um, and I'm gonna skip a couple here but it's involuntary when you present a louder tone you get a contraction of the stapedial muscle so that's the important remember we talked about stapedius muscle in the middle ear well this is the important thing that it does okay it contracts to loud sounds thought to have some protective mechanism um, and there's other theories as to why we have this reflex. Um, we talked about ipsilateral and contralateral, right? So there's an ipsilateral pathway and a contralateral pathway, and here they are. Uh, don't expect you to memorize this, but just so you've been uh, exposed to it, the pathway goes cochlea, eighth cranial nerve to the cochlear nucleus, the SOC, right, we talked about the superior olivary complex <clears throat> being an extremely important central pathway. And then it courses <clears throat> contralaterally, passes midline to the facial nerve, down to the sapedius muscle, and then obviously the cochlea. So then you have the, um, uh, or sorry, so then it, it passes to the sapedius muscle, and then you have the contraction there. Um, and so here, that's the contralateral pathway. Here you have the ipsilateral, where it's cochlear nucleus, eighth nerve, cochlear nucleus, SOC, facial nerve on the ipsilateral side, and then you have the contraction. Okay, so that's the acoustic reflex pathway. Again, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, and uh, but again, just wanted to make sure you understand there is this auditory central auditory pathway that's involved in in auditory perception and protection uh, through the acoustic reflex.